വെൽക്കം ടു ഈ പാത്ത് ടു സക്സസ് വെഞ്ച ഓർഗനൈസ്ഡ് ബൈ ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ഓർഗൻ ആൻഡ് മാക്സിലോ ഫേഷ്യൽ പെത്തോളജി പുഷ്പഗിരി കോളേജ് ഓഫ് ജെൻറൽ സയൻസസ് വയം ഇ ടീച്ചിങ് ആൻഡ് ഇ ലേണിംഗ് കൊലാബറേറ്റ് ടുഡേ വി ഹാവ് an eminent resource person who is a an eminent speaker an eminent academician and of course now an eminent clinical practitioner dr prem anand prabhagran from india who is now a full time resident of kuwait he will be talking on maxillary sinus its anatomy physiology histology and the clinical significance over to you dr premanand hi uh, good afternoon everybody uh, i am uh, dr premanand and this evening uh, we are going to have a discussion about the histology of maxillary sinus uh, and uh, uh, the maxillary sinus as we all know uh, we have we have two maxillary sinuses uh, on either sides of the nasal cavity and uh, this is uh, one of the largest paranasal sinuses we have and the exact location of uh, the maxillary sinus is uh, inside the body of maxilla and uh, the size and the shape of the maxillary sinus varies in each skull and at the same time if you take another skull like in individuals uh, also we can see there is variation in size and shape now at the time of birth the maxillary sinus will be having a tubular size uh, i mean tubular shape followed by that in childhood it acquires an ovoid shape and in adulthood it acquires its peculiar roughly quadrangular uh, pyramidal shape the quadrangular pyramidal shape means it will be having four uh, uh, angles and it will be having four uh, faces or three or four sides and this is uh, one of the first sinuses to develop in embryonic period and uh, this was first uh, described i mean uh, in illustrated described and illustrated by leonardo da vinci and uh, the anatomical uh, features and its significance and uh, other things uh, were explained well by uh, nathaniel hymore a british uh, surgeon in the year 1651 and that's why the maxillary sinus has got the name andrum of hymore uh and this andrum of hymore uh, is having uh, in actually if you take an individual uh, individual uh, maxilla bone maxillary bone you can see there is an opening uh, that opening is called ostium and the ostium opens into the middle meatus of nose at the lower part of hiatus semilunaris above the uh, nasal floor and uh, this uh, this in, in an articulated skull if you see the size of the ostium uh, it will be compromised by uh, a few bones like the uncinate process of ethmoid above the ethmoidal process of inferior nasal concha below and the vertical part of palatine process behind and above and in front uh, part of lacrimal bones and now uh, this uh, sinus uh, the opening of sinus is located on the medial wall of uh, medial wall uh, actually uh, above two thirds like it means is just above the uh, nasal i mean sinus cavity floor the opening is towards and as a result of that uh, the cavity uh, you know it won't be able to drain properly if you go back to the evolution of primates like human beings uh, uh, we ac- we achieved uh, the bipedal uh, bipedal posture like standing erect posture but if you go back to the ancestors what we what we can see is uh, they'll be having you know a four uh, limbed locomotion and their face down actually towards the gravity and that is why in uh, primate group uh, if you observe uh, there is no problem in training the sinus uh, towards the gravity that is natural but as we acquire uh, the topmost position in evolutionary tree uh, we lost uh, that particular feature of uh, automatic drainage of sinus uh, because of the erect posture that we achieved from evolution and the sinus uh, opening the ostium is lying two third above the uh, two third uh, on the wall of uh, sinus above the nasal or above the sinus uh, floor so these things we should uh, remember and uh, and uh, now uh, about a few words about uh, the the embryology like uh, around 65th to the 70th day of gestation uh, if you observe you can see that a mucosal evagination arises 
from the central part of middle meatus of uh, middle meatus of nose that area and will be having an axis oriented anterior posteriorly and this uh, imagination this mucosal imagination uh, migrates exactly into the body of maxilla and form a small coelom of uh, 1 uh, cubic centimeter uh, and having a uh, like a cure a size of about 3 to 10 millimeters at the time of birth and uh, further development occurs by a process called uh, progressive pneumatization uh, pneumatization means nothing but air filled because they are all the sinuses air filled cavities so uh, progressive pneumatization process happens and uh, until 7 years of age and then uh, this uh, until 12 to 14 years of age age it continues at the rate of uh, around 2 to 3 mm per year in all directions to acquire the uh, quadrangular, quadrangular pyramidal shape now uh, if you if you if you check the uh, sinus bones in case of uh, children who are having the permanent teeth erupting after the eruption the, the 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 space occupied by the tooth germs permanent tooth germs in the bone will also be acquired by the maxillary sinus coelom and in old age when you lose your uh, permanent dentition uh, the, the cavity the, the sinus uh, acquires uh, all the or it expands into the toothless alveolar recesses also so that's the way the development or uh, the age related changes progresses now, uh, adjacent to the maxillary sinus, uh, there is another uh, important uh, uh, thing that lies, uh, which is of anatomical significance. That is nothing but your pterygopalatine uh, fossa, the pterygopalatine fossa. And the pterygopalatine fossa, the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus is uh, contributing uh, to the formation of anterior wall of this particular pterygopalatine fossa. And the anatomical significance is the location of uh, pterygopalatine ganglion, uh, the maxillary artery, terminal branches, uh, some emissary veins, maxillary nerve, and the nerve of the thyroid canal and some accumulated fat uh, is located in this particular uh, spinopalatine fossa. Uh, since it is, since it, uh, it is uh, lying, uh, uh, means maxillary sinus is forming the uh, anterior wall of the uh, fossa, I just uh, put it over there. Maybe it will help you for your viva or something like that. Now, uh, now, uh, it's about uh, a few age-related changes that already we explained uh, at the time of birth to uh, uh, till uh, geriatric. Uh, the sinus is undergoing uh, so much of changes uh, with regarding the shape, uh, the size, uh, and all these things. Okay. So at the time of birth, uh, around zero to three years of age, if you observe the the, the this location of maxillary sinus will be filled with uh, deciduous uh, tooth germs. At the time of birth and by around uh, age of three years uh, the sinus acquires half the adult size now when the child uh, becomes three to four years old uh, according proportionate in proportionate to the bones of face the growth of bones of face uh, sinus again develops and uh, in this three to four years of age uh, the location of maxillary sinus is uh, almost uh, near the second deciduous molars and also uh, around the crypts of first permanent molars, that will be the location. When it becomes the seven in in seven to nine years of age, uh, the growth corresponds to the eruption of permanent teeth. And again, uh, the canine uh, will be presented as a ridge in the anterior surface of the maxillary sinus. In nine to twelve years of age, uh, you can see that the sinus floor and the anterior floor will be at the same level. And the position of alveolar process uh, vacates and it becomes more air filled, like become more pneumatized and it acquires the quadrangular pyramidal shape. Now, 12 to 15 years of age, the floor will be uh, almost interrelated to second premolars of axilla and second molars, that area. And volume will be about uh, 15 to 20, 20 ml. And in old age, uh, when you lose your uh, teeth, as we explained before, uh, the pneumatization process uh, will take over the alveolar bone. Now, uh, regarding our subject, uh, our uh, oral histology is concerned, we are much bothered about uh, the lining of oral, uh, oral uh, means uh, the sinus, the maxillary sinus lining. And that is nothing but your zero-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And in this picture, what you see is uh, some sort of uh, mucus uh, that be uh, forming a layer on the surface of uh, the zero-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And you can see the cilia lashing the mucus airway. This is actually a pictorial representation. Uh, 
uh, now the exact uh, histological uh, structure of uh, sinus uh, that we all know uh, the important thing is uh, the lining that is the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium so this is columnar epithelium uh, and the name is pseudo pseudo means what false stratified means multi layered so false multi layered it means that this is not a multi layered epithelium even though it appears to be multi layered then why it appears to be multi layered it appears to be multi layered because of the orientation of nuclei at different levels so that is why this epithelium is called pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and in this pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium uh, there is cilia and mucus that is a functional component of the maxillary sinus and uh, uh, and in between the epithelium you can see uh, goblet cells and this goblet cells will be secreting uh, mucus and uh, the mucus uh, will be trapping uh, the foreign materials or dust or whatever getting trapped inside the sinuses and just below the uh, mucosa uh, that is oral epithelium that is stratified ep sorry i am sorry uh, this is not oral epithelium the stratified ciliated columnar epithelium you can see the lamina propria will be having capillaries and sometimes uh, mucus glands will be there and jibini that if you go deeper again you can see the periosteum lining the uh, sinus bone uh, this is uh, again uh, a comparison i made on the right side of the slide you can see uh, the columnar typical uh, simple columnar epithelium and on the left side is uh, our uh, area of interest that is the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and if you closely observe we can see that the orientation of nuclei at different levels and with cilia so uh, on histological examination uh, for your exams or whatever uh, if they keep this particular slide you can uh, you can identify the pseudo stratified ciliated epithelium with the help of the presence of cilia on the top now uh, again uh, about a few features uh, histologically uh, this uh, sinus uh, mucosa is also called schneiderian membrane or pars membrane membranaceous mucosa this is another name for that and uh, uh, there are uh, i already explained uh, about the pseudo stratified uh, ciliated columnar epithelium term why it got its name uh, main thing is the appearance and the orientation of nuclei at different levels then uh, followed by that the goblet cells are there uh, i said it secretes uh, mucus so what is a functional component of uh, pseudo stratified ciliated uh, columnar epithelium uh, here is actually the cilia and the mucus secreted by the goblet cell and the mucus cells in the lamina propria so the mucus we have two types of mucus one is a uh, some sort of uh, thick uh, and uh, sticky mucus and that is the mucus which uh, forms the uh, luminal uh, ball of your uh, uh, sinus and just beneath the thick uh, sticky mucus Uh, you can see watery uh, sole type thin mucus in which the cilia is uh, moving like the cilia is located and uh, this thick mucus it the function of thick mucus is actually trapment of all the foreign materials including bacteria or microorganisms and the uh, the dust particles which got entrapped inside the sinus and the typical uh, lashing movement of the sinus will take away all the uh, trapped mucus with uh, contaminants outside now uh, this is uh, the ct scan i just put it there for for the identification purpose like ct scan you can see the maxillary sinus very well on either side of the nasal cavity the dark shadows typically represents the maxillary sinus uh, now about uh, the functions so what are the functions of maxillary sinus the main thing since it is a pneumatized like air filled cavity this thing uh, lightens the weight of the skull so since it since the since it lightens the weight of the skull it reduces the workload of the muscles associated and it helps in maintenance of the balance of head on neck and also the free movements of uh, your uh, skull on the joints like your uh, vertebra now uh, another function is uh, the impact forces will be taken out and it add resonance to your voice then transmission of some sort of vibrations of your sound and uh, thermal insulation and humidification of the air that you breathe in and the secretion of antibacterial lysosomes and iga and and again uh, they say uh, if you uh, closely observe 
the higher microscopic levels of or histopathology, I mean, sorry, histology of the maxillary sinus, uh, you can see uh, some sort of things uh, which are missing. Uh, again, evolutionary significance. Uh, in our ancestors, they used to uh, smell. That is, the olfaction function was very advanced in our ancestors. As uh, as we evolved uh, into the you know higher group of animals, like in uh, the evolutionary tree, we lost that particular function. So uh, previous, if you go back to the uh, primate uh, family, this uh, this there is uh, the, the vestigial function of olfaction is also there. In human beings, that is absent. And uh, now we come back uh, to the nerve supply uh, for the uh, purpose of completion. I put that over there. That is nothing but the maxillary division of trigeminal nerve uh, supplies the maxillary sinus. Then we have arterial supply from maxillary artery. Then venous drainage is from pterygoid venous plexus, pterygoid venous plexus, and again uh, spinopalatine and facial veins, and uh, lymphatic drainage correspondingly uh, towards the submandibular nodes, deep cervical nodes, and retropharyngeal nodes. Uh, now about uh, the clinical uh, examination. Uh, clinical examination, if uh, a patient comes uh, to you uh, with some sinus problem, or uh, sometimes uh, we may, I mean, the patient may present with uh, uh, some sort of uh, feeling, uh, you know, they say some sort of irritation or painful irritation in the upper uh, posteriors. Uh, in such cases, uh, if you are able to rule out uh, uh, like if you are confirmed about clinically confirmed about uh, the known pathology or there is no pathological conditions existing for the upper maxillary uh, molars and premolars, then you can suspect uh, the sinusitis. So one is you can examine the uh, face facial wall of the sinus uh, for any symmetry, like symmetry asymmetry, then deformities or uh, redness or edema, whatever. Then you can uh, extra oral, you can palpate the facial wall of the sinus and inside the mouth uh, in the oral cavity above the premolar region uh, where the bone is very thin, you can palpate and see. Then uh, you can uh, check for the paresthesia, numbness, tenderness at, at the upper uh, molar premolar region. And another thing is uh, you can ask the patient to sit on a chair and you can ask him to bend uh, you know, towards the gravity, like towards, the, towards his tie. And if you feel some sort of uh, pressure feeling on uh, on this uh, maxillary body area, like the body of maxillary area, then you can uh, suspect uh, some accumulation of fluid inside, maybe mucus, uh, or it can be any other pathology. In such cases, you can go for X-rays or CT scans or higher radiology uh, radiological examinations. And another one of uh, interest is actually transillumination test. Uh, it is actually performed in a dark room. Uh, with an electrically safe bulb inserted inside the patient's mouth, closing the lips. And good transillumination represents presence of air in the sinus. And if there is failure, uh, means that if there is a shadow, like it can be pus or a solid lesion, any tumor, or sometimes mucosal thickening because of any other underlying pathology. Now, uh, so what are the what all pathology? conditions uh, you can get in maxillary sinus. One is the common thing I said uh, about the maxillary sinusitis. Maxillary, maxillary sinusitis, the main thing is because of the drainage problem. Since the, the orifice of the, that is the ostium is lying uh, above the uh, sinus floor. That is the main reason for that. Then uh, second is anthrolithiasis, nothing but the formation of stone inside the maxillary sinus. I have seen a case uh, when I was doing my post-graduation in Savita. And uh, they operated the uh, sinus and they took the calcified things out. And it was, uh, it was calcium masses with uh, aspergillus fungus. That case was uh, infected with aspergillus uh, fungus also. So such things can happen. If there is aspergillus infection or if there is any uh, sort of uh, huge uh, uh, stone formation or calcified masses, the patient can present to you with uh, blood-stained uh, nasal discharges. Now, retention cyst can happen. Now, uh, oroandral fistula. Oral and oroandral fistula is nothing but oroandral communication. So, it can happen uh, while uh, doing uh, surgical extractions. Uh, if uh, the opening uh, of the sinus towards the oral cavity through the socket of extracted tooth is less than 2 millimeter, then uh, it won't be a much, uh, much a big problem. The thing is, patient will get uh, in a panic situation. You should uh, reinforce the patient that nothing will happen. And uh, you can uh, you can uh, use some uh, 
uh, sponges, intra socket uh, sponges for dressing the socket. We can put a tight suture over there. Then you can ask uh, the patient to take stick on to the medicines, antibiotics, plus uh, any uh, anti allergic, like in order to avoid uh, sneezing and all these things, you can uh, uh, add up uh, some sort of uh, anti allergic medications in addition to anti inflammatory and antibiotics for uh, infected tooth. And uh, there is a medicine available like here uh, in area where I am practicing here. We have Reparil. Reparil is actually a combination of uh, acin and uh, acin is nothing but horse uh, chestnut extract plus diethylamine salicylate. It is a Reparil one tablet. We used to give for uh, edema uh, in case of uh, uh, in case of you know infections. So these type of things can uh, take away uh, the what to say fluid accumulation and allergy related uh, sneezing and all these things like it means uh, we are going to uh, we we want to assure that the sinus is not getting irritated and the patient uh, is not going to uh, you know uh, he is not going to sneeze or is not going to apply much pressure onto that particular site it may bleed so if the sinus opening uh, is less than two millimeter is going to be okay but if it is more than two millimeter then we need to we need to go for surgical interventions now, again, uh, sometimes uh, uh, as age advances, uh, the thickening of, uh, the, that is the, the, the bony, bony plate that is separating the maxillary sinus from your oral cavity will be uh, less than 12 millimeter. Sometimes the total loss of uh, bony compartment uh, is another feature. Only the mucosa separates uh, the sinus uh, flow from the oral cavity. So in such cases, it can happen. The oral anterior fistula can happen. Now, uh, sinus lift procedure. Uh, they uh, in the case of implants, uh, we need at least a 13 millimeter uh, alveolar bone uh, supports the vector closely, uh, or closely for the implant to be a successful one. In such cases, uh, compromising the size of the maxillary sinus, we build up uh, the graft uh, in that area to get more bone thickness. Then there is something called a cald well loop operation. Uh, above the um, canine uh, eminence, and a window will be opened to uh, enter inside the maxillary sinus. It can be for removing the foreign material which got trapped inside, like maybe a bit of tooth, or sometimes for draining the sinus, they do this particular surgery. Then Ogden's uh, line is actually a line, theoretical line. You can uh, line uh, extending from the median canvas of the eye towards the ankle of the mandible. And superior to this particular line, if any tumor happens inside the maxillary sinus, uh, that will be of first prognosis because uh, of the proximity towards your orbit and the middle cranial fossa. Uh, this is again uh, one uh, scan uh, thing. Uh, you can see uh, uh, the extension of sinus and the proximity of the upper uh, posterior, especially the molars and the second premolar towards the lumen of that particular lumen or this uh, cavity of the maxillary sinus. So that signifies the importance uh, of uh, exodontia, especially surgical cases, or even a strong tooth if you are planning to remove, uh, then uh, you should be a little careful about the uh, sinus uh, floor and the extractions, that's it. You can just see the extension. And with this, uh, I would like to conclude my uh, uh, small lecture. It's a very small, uh, short lecture on uh, the histology of maxillary sinus. And uh, as exam point of view uh, for BDS children, uh, one is uh, they can ask you histology of uh, maxillary sinus. Uh, second thing is the question uh, as such, like the antrum of high mouth. Then sometimes uh, the functions of maxillary sinus. Then uh, mm, then sometimes uh, some MCQs can be asked about the uh, consistency of uh, cilia uh, in the maxillary sinus, the microtubular structure, and all these things. So, uh, and clinically, when you back, uh, when you once you start uh, doing your practice, uh, it should be uh, very uh, clear about the relationship of the maxillary sinus with upper uh, posteriors. So, with that, I would like to conclude my lecture. Thank you so much.